to the places that you visit regularly. So if you visit somebody's post and you respond to it, notice I'm doing that, and you respond to their Facebook post, what will happen is that that person becomes a regular kind of uh, profile that shows up as they post stuff. And there's a built-in component that Adds to, there's about 27 of them regularly showing up if you kind of respond to their stuff. And of the many, many, many um, uh, friends that I have on Facebook, I only, if I only respond to a few of them, only kind of 27 of them kind of have, have regular contact. If I don't go looking at all of my other friends, I don't hear from them. And why this is important is because Facebook will kind of monitor our very human behavior of checking in with the people that agree with us, right? And they're watching, and they will send us advertising messages that match the kind of stuff that we're looking at. That's why it's important to Facebook. That's one of the challenges with Facebook, is that we end up talking to people who think like us. And the reason I know that is because every now and again, every now and then, somebody disagrees with me. Imagine that. <laughs> so when they disagree, I, and it's a newcomer, I kind of go visit their profile. And I open it up and I look, and they're connected to a whole wide range of people who are saying stuff that's completely inconsistent with my thinking. And I realize there's a whole world of thinking going on with the person who disagreed with me. That's one of the problems. The second problem is that we, when we dive down into that rabbit warren of people with whom we most identify, we tend to stay there. Right? We tend to kind of trip out on um, uh, conversations that kind of match our own, that kind of match our own thinking. We, we they think like us, and pretty soon we think everybody thinks like us, because we're only reading the people who agree with us. And what happens is that we lose our capacity to actually be in relationship with people who have a different experience. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you don't have computers. You probably much less know what Facebook is. You probably heard of it. But let me test this with you. When you encounter someone who has a different perspective than yours, what happens? Do you either avoid them, oh, you see them coming and soon make a left turn, <laughs> or do you just not talk about it? You just don't, you just avoid that topic because you disagree, right? <laughs> Peace in the house. Part of Peace in the house, right? All I have to do is say proportional representation and watch your faces. <laughs> right? We've not had that conversation. Peace in the house. Some of us have lost whole family members, whole sides of family members, because of the different perspective of perspectives of what's going on in the U.S. administration. I hear that all the time, especially now. This is what the writer to Timothy is addressing in the scriptures this morning. He's addressing our penchant for lifting up the texts that we like, the texts that match our thinking. And he's saying, read them all. Read them all. This text comes to us, it sounds like um, there's a wise elder on his deathbed saying, hear what you do. Here's what you do. He's encouraging the listener to engage all of the scriptures, to hear all of its voice. Because all of it's useful. All of it addresses some particular human condition. 
all of it addresses the breadth, the depth, and width of human experience in relationship to God. All of it. And we would do well to pay attention to all of it. The church has been doing it for thousands of years. Now you might be sitting there, but Blair, the texts seem to be addressed entirely to the preacher. Go out and preach the world. We saw it in the text. We heard it in the text that Carol read. But when we read the message, the advice is given to all of the hearers. For those of you who don't know, the message is a paraphrase of the whole Bible written by a brilliant Presbyterian pastor and evangelist who had a passion for anyone who would dare to follow Christ to engage the text in ways that bring life to life. Eugene Peterson took the often difficult language and the difficult translations of the Greek and the Hebrew and turned it into conversational English. I told you he was a Presbyterian minister. From, he was from Maryland. And he actually took years to write, to, to listen to his congregation. He listened to how they spoke. He listened to the words they used. He listened to their vernacular. And then he began to write for them. The message has sold 16 million copies around the world, written for a particular congregation with a particular voice. Eugene Peterson uh, was um, that pastor for 29 years until he retired. And then he came to Regent College at UBC and was a professor of uh, Christian theology and spirituality, evangelical spirituality, there until he retired in 1998. Eugene Peterson died this week. His funeral was yesterday. So it seems that it would be useful to read his version of this letter to Timothy from Eugene Peterson's deathbed. Hear these words. You're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. But you, keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good times. Keep the message alive. Do a thorough job as God's servant. This isn't just for preachers, is it? It's for anyone who would follow the Jewish carpenter. I think we're in a time when people have no stomach for solid teaching. I think we're in a time when people are filling up on spiritual junk food, eating only the tasty bits that have flash and polish of populist thinking. They certainly don't want to hear anything that doesn't fit their narrow worldview. And when we hear them speak with authority of the scriptures that leads to a narrow and often abusive Conclusion, the treatment of women, slaves, refugees, people of color, indigenous people. Rather than hold up a different and more beautiful story side by side, we tend to turn, don't we? We tend to shut off the tradition. If that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. Right? And faithful people walk away from a particular story. So that's why we need to learn the scriptures. That's why we need to listen in for the voice of scripture 
all Scripture. When we step onto the path of Christian discipleship, we realize that this is the place where we practice listening to the voice that calls us to a different outcome. A voice that challenges our own status quo. A voice that breaks down the walls of our silos. Think of the Facebook experience. We create silos and we stay in them, forgetting there's a whole other realm of conversation happening beyond our own little world. The voice of Scripture, listening to the voice of Scripture, breaks those silos down. It's God's voice. And it's God's voice speaking a gospel of radical inclusivity. We practice listening to the voice of Scripture particularly so that we're practiced hearing those with whom we disagree. Rather than picking up our marbles and taking them to another sandbox when someone says or does something that offends us or with whom we disagree, the voice of Scripture, God's voice, is already teaching us new behavior. Here's Peterson's version. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful, one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live in God's way. I like to say, we're called to be kingdom people with each other here and now if we ever expect God's kingdom to come. Listening for the voice of Scripture helps us to hear God's voice when all we hear is our own and those with whom we agree. God's voice calls us to radical inclusion. God's voice calls us to listen carefully and lean into one another. And that's hard. That's why we call it the practice of listening. We practice for the sake of God's kingdom coming. Yeah? Yeah. Amen. Please pray. Holy God. When we think we are right, no word gets in. May the story we hear, may the wisdom from someone's deathbed speak to us today. That we might be marked with listening. May our pattern of behavior shift. May we open our hearts. May we open our ears and listen for your voice, which often comes from left field. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing for the healing of the world. Amen.